Hi, everybody, and welcome to our industry spotlight of the day, which today features Christian Watts, uh, the man, the myth, the magpie. I am like probably many of you, my first introduction to Christian was watching him flit around the arrival conference in his magpie t-shirt. And I asked myself, what the heck is magpie? And today we're gonna get the answer to that, which I know many of you as small operators and medium and large operators uh, want to know. And also Christian happens to be an industry legend as far as his insight into the industry. And so we're gonna also probably probe him a few questions just about what's going on in our, in our interesting tours and attractions industry. So Christian, really happy to have you here. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for asking me, I appreciate it. Of course. Before we get into Magpie, can you just give us the little uh, elevator pitch of who you were before you started Magpie? What what were you up to? Yeah, I moved to San Francisco in um, in well late late nineties and started the bus company. Moved here, bought a bus, started doing city tours, and just grew a bus company from scratch. There was three of us invested three thousand dollars each to buy a bus. And then moved that into Hop On Up Off a few years later. So bought the first open top double decker buses into San Francisco. Started um, with city sightseeing here, and just grew from there. So I've been 20 years really as a as a bus operator, doing um, doing Hop On Up Off double decker buses running around San Francisco. The the Hop I'm I'm a New Yorker, and so I see those buses all the time. What I'm interested. In, what for you is the the future of those buses, or what's going on in that sort of segment of the industry? Because they're kind of ubiquitous. We see them in London, and we see them any, anywhere you go. What uh, what's the state of what's the state of those sort of hop on hop off buses right now? I mean, yeah, they they are ubiquitous, and it's actually probably I started up in San Francisco because of New York, because they were so popular in New York and London at the time. I don't see them going anywhere. I know people like to tell tales of this is a, it's an it's had its time and we've reached peak hop on up off, but ultimately people, most people still come to a city and they want to see the sites and they come to San Francisco and they want to see the Golden Gate Bridge. They want to see the Golden Gate Park. They, they want, they want to see Chinatown. You still have a list of places that you want to see. Um, it's nice for Airbnb to say, you know, the, the jellyfish experience in the outer whatever neighborhood, but, still 90 plus percent of people want to see the main parts of the city and hop on up off buses are actually perfect for that it's a great way for in around two hours to to sort of get an overview of a city but i don't see it really going anywhere for for a while at a certain point you hopped off the hop off buses and went into the magpie world what was what was the catalyst for you starting your own startup and leaving that leaving that world behind? Yeah, so but basically, I, I contracted with another operator in San Francisco. So I've pulled out of the operation a little bit, and we do a, a basically a, um, a joint service now with the two brands. Um, but a part of it is frustration with running a commoditized product. When I started up on a path, we were the only game in town. I enjoy selling that over the years it became more and more commoditized with more and more competitors coming in and that's not a place that i enjoy sitting in um that the magpie came about because of a problem that we always had in distribution and it was me going to trade shows i used to go to a lot of trade shows we worked with about 150 resellers and just seeing them all grapple with the same problem. It was the same problem with us just trying to get our content onto their website or their brochure. And then once it's there, trying to keep it up, trying to keep it up to date. And knowing the industry, knowing both sides of the industry from, from years at those trade shows, I just got to see that it's a huge problem. And you've got here hundreds or thousands of people dealing with something manually that should be done on a platform. It should be done um, through through the internet and through um, automation. So just really, it was solving our own problem. I, I love it. You solved yourself and then you went out and said this might be a solution for other people out there. My question to you with Magpie is who is it for? 
so as you said, it's automating some of the tedium of loading up your products onto online travel agencies like Kaya, or like uh, Viator and Expedia, et cetera. Who, who is sort of the customer of Magpie? Well, first of all, it's, it's specifically for tours and activities providers, right? So it's, we're not in any other industry. It's, it's only for this travel industry and, and not hotels. It's just tours and activities. Um, we like to think it's for everyone. I mean, we, we, we're trying to be the single source of truth for everyone in this industry, whether you are one person um, walking tour once a week on the side of it or whether you're Disney. And, you know, the, 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 there's, a, there's a free version of Magpie, so we don't think there's any reason anybody is not on Magpie, even if it's just to store your single source of truth. Most people have that source of truth on a on a Word doc, or actually more often it's on six Word docs or on a spreadsheet or somewhere else. So if nothing else, it's a place to store that so that you know what your product is today. Because as soon as you start reselling that anywhere, even if it's only on your own website and you've got profiles on, on TripAdvisor and Google and everything else, you quickly start losing touch with what your product is and you end up with 10 different versions. So even on a basic level, just to, just to have it stored in one place so that you know what the latest product descriptions are is, is a value even before you started reselling it. But definitely as, as, as you start to get more resellers and you start to work with more OTAs or offline distributors, that just becomes more of a, more and more of a problem. And keeping them up to date is a task that never stops. We, we all have changes to make. It doesn't matter where you operate, that there are changes that happen to you from the city or the place you operate. And there, are, and there are changes that you should be making internally as well. You should be always upgrading. I think you should be always upgrading your product. So those changes are important and they, they should happen. A lot of people I think don't change their product enough because it's such a hassle to manage those changes. Uh, I. I from my position as trip school, we're constantly telling our new entrepreneurs who are developing tour businesses that you should think of your tour product as an iteration of a previous version and continue to evolve and innovate and always transform it. It keeps your brain going, it keeps your product fresh. To me, actually, Magpie is a great compliment to that because it means it, it's keeping life easy for those innovators to constantly evolve and adapt to a changing market. And so that, that to me seems like a great benefit. I have a, I have a lot of questions. I'm gonna keep this short and focus on distribution and the OTAs as kind of the truth keeper of all of these different, of all of these different operators loading their products. What are some of the common, I guess, themes of problems or, or lacks that you see in the way in which people are listing their products or presenting them to these OTAs? Well, I think th th there's, there's always this debate, that the OTA debate, should I or shouldn't I? I? I believe, first of all, fundamentally, I believe you should have your product everywhere you can. I, 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 I really don't like this. You should just focus. You should focus on your own website, absolutely. That's your number one channel. It should be everyone's number one channel. But it shouldn't be instead of distribution elsewhere. I believe you've got a product you need to get it onto shelves in the in the stores. And the stores are out there. They they might be called an OTA or they might be an offline distributor. They might be a travel agent. It could be anything, but those are the shops that sell these products. And you need your product on those shelves. So if, if you're not on those shelves, you're missing out on sales. So fundamentally, I think you should sell everywhere you can. Obviously, that creates a problem that you need to then go and manage that. So you don't want to, if you're a one-person operator, you don't want 150 channels because you'll spend your time doing nothing but managing them, which is what we're trying to solve. But, yeah, I mean, the, the, the problems that people have is that they, they do, they probably upload their products to too many places without organizing it. So they end up with outdated information in too many places, which then leads to customer service issues. And people come expecting the wrong product um, and the refunds, the, the, you know, re refunds um, obviously cause headaches all the way around. Um, so I think basically it's incorrect information leading to customer service issues are the biggest, are the biggest frustration. 
and then you know just just managing those contracts as well it's it's still a hassle it's still an offline work an offline world and just managing those updates and pricing updates and contracts is is also a big hassle for people the the industry needs to move on and i think actually covid is it's a bit of a cliche that everything the technology gets advanced by two three four five years during these times but i think it's it is going to happen in this industry i think covid's pushed us ahead a few years in terms of distribution and OTAs in the world that Magpie lives in, what does that look like for the horizons ahead for distribution? Do you see kind of great consolidation in the industry, or do you do you, you know do you see big players winning out bigly, or do you do you, do you, do you, you see other? I unfortunately yeah. just did. Uh, <laughs> um, we won't have to say that anymore in a couple of weeks, but. Um, I, I thought there'd be more, con, more, more. Um, yeah, I, I thought there'd be more moves last year. There weren't, there weren't many moves at all. And I, I think everyone also, there's a tendency for everyone to think that everything gets cleaner and everything gets tidier, and that there's, there's, um, you know, we, we're, we're going to end up with the big three or the big five. I don't think that's going to happen at all. I think we've got the big three or three, four or five now. I think we're going to have the new players really start emerging. Airbnb is going to grow into the market. Amazon's probably going to come in. Google's going to come in. Maybe Uber. But I don't think the old players are going to go anywhere either. I think we just end up with more. So whereas today you should be managing whatever your number is, 10 or 20 distribution channels, I think you know some will disappear and the other ones will fill the gap. If you look at Asia as well, they, they tend to be forming per country. So you've got KK Day now is, is the OTA for, for Taiwan. You've got My Real Trip is the OTA for South Korea. You've got, you've got Travel Loka in Indonesia. So each country's kind of developing their own. So I think unfortunately it just gets messier and these companies keep getting funded and funding me, whether that's right and wrong with their valuations, it means they're not gonna go anywhere because they can't. I think especially those two, those two big funding rounds that happened in the last couple of years, they've now got valuations which are impossible to probably get back to for quite a long time. So <laughs> it's difficult for yeah. shareholders to put that kind of money in and then walk away. So they have to keep doubling down. And I think there's a reason for all of them to, to stick around. I'm sure there'll be, there'll, be, there'll be a little bit of movement. You know, there's a lot of talk about what Expedia are going to do and where Viator will end up. But ultimately, I think we'll end up with a lot of a lot of players still in the future. Good news for Magpie. What, uh, what, do you do when, what do you do when an operator needs to speak differently to different OTAs? In other words, they can't just replicate the content on every platform, but, but want to make sure that they're playing the right game on each different platform, especially if you're speaking to a Vietnamese consumer and you're speaking to you know, a, a global platform. How does, mm -hmm. uh, how does Magpie tackle that? Yeah, I mean, we, we've, we've built a lot in. It's, it's, it, it is important. I think for a small operator, it's less important. I think having one version out there is just fine. And you can get too bogged down with trying to create, trying to play every different platform differently. But you can have one product and you can create as many different versions of that as you like. An, an example of a version would be a language version. So you have it translated into languages. But as you say, you might want a different version of that for the Chinese market a different description of that product for the Chinese market or any, or any market. So within one product, you can store different versions. Um, yeah, it's a bit technical, but what, what took us a long time to, to create Magpie was the, the data structure. So within a product, we have about 110 pieces of data. A data being what's the maximum height for this product? What's the minimum age? What's the, what's the minimum weight? All this kind of stuff that isn't necessarily always applicable, but it, but it adds up. You've got your duration and you've got your cancellation policy. And, but a lot of that stuff doesn't need to change with each version. So our, our way of looking at it is if you, can, if you can structure your product correctly, when you want to change something, you just change that one piece. So if you want to change the long description, you should just be able to change that, but your maximum height didn't change. So you can use now the maximum height across all of your channels and all of your OTAs and everything else. So it's really about having you focus on what's important and getting that stuff, 
getting that content really good. So your, your list of highlights is really important and that's what's gonna create conversions. Your main description is, is really important. Cancellation policy, less so. It's just write it once and be done with it and, and get it loaded up. So Magpie is really also about focusing on what's gonna help you convert, which is getting that content great. And your photos as well. Do you offer advice on sort of the right product description or kind of what, what works well? Because I mean, I've, I've been on many an OTA every single day of my life and a lot of it ends up looking like the same. Do you have any advice to, uh, to operators as they, as they approach their, their copy on their, on their, on their listing? Yeah, we, we did a workshop at the last, um, at the last arrival on, on that subject. I think we need to consolidate that into some, probably written form and do a couple of videos on it. Um, and actually, Matt, I, I don't know if you know Matt Newton, but he, he, I think he still writes blog posts, but he wrote some great stuff on how to write your, your descriptions. Um, and I, I think people get caught up on it, but it's about answering, it's about answering the questions. It's, it's about putting your head in the head of a consumer and asking, why am I not gonna buy this product today? And answering those questions. Oh, I don't quite understand where it starts put that right at the top. I don't understand, I've got, I've got a three-year-old. Is this gonna be a, appropriate for my three-year-old? So get all these all these blockers, anything that's gonna stop that person hitting the buy now button are questions that you need to answer up front. And, and we've all got them, it doesn't matter what product you have. You've all got these questions that just gives the consumer too much of, a, too much of an unknown that they'll go and research something else or they'll get distracted and they won't hit the buy now button. So it's really about answering all of their fears and and, um, and and questions up front. So there's no reason for them not to hit the buy now button. That's what it's all about, really. It's all about a conversion. It's, you know, you can, you, there's a lot of fancy um, workshops and this and that, but it's, it's all about presenting that information, which I think people don't spend enough time on. You, you do all this marketing to bring people to your website or to the OTA website. And you've got a few seconds of that person reading that content. And that's the only thing you've got at that point in time. That's going to get your conversion or not. And if you've got typos in there or you've written it poorly or it's too long or too short, you're going to lose most of the people. You're going to lose most of the people anyway. You're not going to convert most of the people. But, you know, one or two percent conversion makes a huge amount of difference. Absolutely. I mean, I, I saw someone's listing where they had a phenomenal photograph and it was the fifth photograph in the series. And I said, that's, that's a small fraction of the people that are going to look at the first one and maybe the second one. So mm -hmm. don't, hide your, don't hide your goods. I, I see that a lot. Um, yeah. For better or worse, you've also waded in the waters of reservation technology. You've become a little bit of an expert on that topic. And I don't know, was that... Was that just by happenstance since you work with OTAs and you kind of got into the world of what API connections look like with integrating with booking software? Or why is it that you seem to pop up not only as an expert in this, but also, you know, you're offering, you're offering advice. I see you in forums and in workshops all the time. What's your, uh, what's your relationship with ResTech? <laughs> that's probably just, uh, that's my geeky background. I, I wrote a reservation system years ago for myself, um, used that for 10 years, then I went and developed one with in-house devs, and now we use one off the shelf, fairly custom. So I've always been into that space. I enjoy that space. Um, and then I think I, I started doing a um, workshop at Arrival. So I ended up being asked lots of questions in, in that space, and I enjoy it. And I, I spend a lot of time with a lot of the res tech folks at trade shows and I enjoy hearing what they're doing. And it's just a bit of a geeky side of me that I like, I like the dev space and i yeah, I found myself in that, in that area, but I also believe in it. I also, but I, I try to help people in that space because I believe people do need to use the latest software and the best software for them. It can save you a ton of time. So I think everything I do, I, I do it because I think people need I, I do believe people need to get the right solutions and get solutions. People need to get off Excel and paper and whatever else they're doing. And people need to stop talking about developing their own res tech solution. That's what I did years ago and it was fine 20 years ago. It's, it's not what you need to do today. 
I, I did it because there was nothing else 20 years ago. But today, there's tons of good solutions. And they are really, there are great solutions out there that will save everyone a ton of time and help them scale their business. So I feel like a, there's a parlor game that a lot of operators play, mm -hmm. which is I'm thinking of switching to another one, to this, to that. And it might be because they've been on Facebook and they see suddenly eight posts of people that love this and they start to say, oh, maybe I should be on that platform. But let me ask you, what is the threshold at which you're going to really want to dive into the differences of these platforms and how much of it is essentially they're all offering a similar version of the same? Like when, when, does it, when does it get specific and what should an operator be looking at just in terms of their own criteria for these platforms? I guess, you know, I guess that's the ultimate question in tech, isn't it? It doesn't matter what the platform is, if it's a messaging platform or a, or a project management platform, there's always a new one and there's always a better one. <clears throat> and because it's so competitive, that's the res tech's job is to market their latest feature and to market the latest this and that and give you a reason to get off. I think most people shouldn't be switching and unless, unless something is just fundamentally broken. You know, there's a lot of features that are nice to have, but I, what, what people need to do is really sit down and work out what's what I need to have. And did I just get hooked on this thing? And is it that important for me to change that one thing? Is that, is that reason enough to get off and use a different, use a different platform? Every platform is going to have little quirks. Every platform is going to have stuff that doesn't work as well as it should, or isn't quite as fast as it should here and could manage this in a slightly better way. But you got to look at the whole and see, is this really going to change? my business if I go move to the next platform. I mean, it's, hard, it's hard to say because there's, there's over a hundred res techs and some are not up to scratch. Um, some people should get off immediately. I'm not thinking of specific brands when I say that, but there are some that are just not good enough. Um, but if, you, you know, if you've got one of the top solutions and it's doing most of what you need, I think most likely stick with it. Pricing is an issue as well. People, you know, if, if, if the pricing's if you're paying too much for it, then that's a, that's a good reason to get off. And uh, as we come out of COVID, we're looking at systems that are tightening their belt buckles and passing on new fees or new monthly charges or things like that onto operators. And so, yeah, there's movement on the pricing front. And what's interesting is that, you know, we're, we're, we're in an interesting world that's different for different kinds of operators. If you are more of the commodity operator where you're playing a pricing game, then there's a lot of, there's a lot of increasing percentages in the food chain of getting your product out there to your customer, both in the OTA and the reservation technology. I'm asking, uh, just as a kind of final question, What's going to budge in terms of these increasing OTA commissions, increasing res tech fees, uh, and then also a race to the bottom for, uh, for, for, for mini tour prices as they try to compete on these platforms that are very price forward? Uh, what, what, what is the future like? Are we moving towards an OTA-less future or a res tech-less future or a consolidation on that front? What are your, what are your thoughts? I don't think the commission is going to budge. I know I, everyone thinks, well, everyone thinks it's been a, on a one-way path. I haven't, I haven't seen that. Um, uh, 20 years ago, it was 25% for a tour operator and 30% for a receptive operator. That was the standard. It's probably still the standard today. Um, th th there has been a bit of a push from, from the OTAs specifically, but I think they were, actually, they were actually getting less commission than most other people were five or 10 years ago. It's, it's, I think a lot, of the, a lot of that frustration is around the way they've done it. You know, sending out emails to 20,000 people saying, as of today, we've changed your commission from this to that. That's not how things are supposed to work. Um, it's supposed to be a negotiation between people. And, but I, I, don't, I don't think it's on a one-way path to more. I think having more OTAs out there is only going to help tour operators. If we ended up with two or three, we'd be in trouble. And, that, and that's where hotels have ended up, right? They've ended up with Booking and, and Expedia and they don't have any leverage and, and Booking and Expedia hold all the cards and they're, they're kind of stuck in a place now which is not good for an independent hotel. I, I don't think we need to get there with 
tools and interaction, tools and activities. And I think because there are so many distribution channels, we could stay away from that. But I also think some people have to just deal with the fact that commission is what it is. Um, whether it's an OTA or a concierge or a tour operator or a travel agent, those people need to get paid to sell your, to sell your product. And if that's 25%, then that's 25%. You should build that into your pricing up front so you haven't got to worry about it. Um, a lot of people think that Google is is free and, and Google is free today on, on organic, obviously, but let's, not, let's assume that goes away as well. And a lot of people think that direct traffic um, is traffic that comes through Google. Anything that goes through anybody is not direct. So if it's gone through Google, Facebook, or an OTA, it's gone through somebody. And that somebody wants that 25%. And Google's not a charity. They, they, they might give us a lot of free traffic today, but you know, they like to make a bit of money. They got bills to they got bills to pay. And they're gonna end up with 25%, I think. As of Facebook. So build it in and start worrying about it, is what I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's a great place to end. Build in your damn twenty five percent and get over it, and <laughs> and go on yeah. from there. Uh, yeah. Christian, uh, you, you had mentioned that you have you have free tools available uh, with Magpie. Would you recommend even small, newer businesses, small to medium operators, uh, reach out to you, or uh, what 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 should they do in order to interact with you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm always here to, I, I, love, I love talking to people. I love having, having people try the product and getting their feedback. We do have a free product on, on Magpie. It's, it's free forever. So you can load your products onto there. You can manage them. You can use a lot of the tools that are they are going to be free forever. And then when you see the need to start paying a subscription, you can start using those tools and upgrade yourself. But especially this year, we just want to get everyone on the platform. And we're doing a big push um, starting starting this month for everyone just to update their profile so that resellers can see who's still around, who's operating, what dates people are going to start operating again. Because right now the biggest problem is nobody knows what's happening. The, the reason for that is we ourselves as operators don't know what's happening. But as we start to get things opening up again, hopefully in the spring, it's, it's going to be a problem for both consumers and resellers to to see you know, who's, who's starting to sell again and what are the opening dates and just catching up with all those updates. And I think that's the next problem. So you can do all of that on Magpie today for free and we're gonna start pushing that as a service where resellers can come to Magpie to see who's still around, who's got new products and you know, when, their, when their next launch date is gonna be hopefully in the spring. So that's, that's going to be what we're doing this year is just try and get the industry back together so that everyone knows who's, everyone knows on both sides of the market who's still around and how to rebuild this thing. Because it's, it's going to take some time. I think it's all over the place right now. And it's, it's kind of, it's, it's like, a, like a natural disaster came through, which is what happened, right? It's, it feels like an earthquake and we're just left with all this rubble and it's going to take a while to rebuild. So I think a lot of industry players are just trying to sort of collect all the pieces and and help get it rebuilt as quickly as possible so we can get back to where we were. Christian, last quick question. You spent a lot of your time thinking about the industry. When you're not thinking about the industry, what do you do with your life? Or do you, are you a hiker? Do you just sit there with whiskey all day? Like what, what, do you, what are you doing when you're not thinking about the travel industry? I like to travel, that's one thing. I used to like to travel before when I, when I could. Um, I like to exercise. I, I do triathlons, so I like to um, get out on my bike and run and, and swim a bit. So that's that's what I spend a lot of my time. That's good. That's good head time. I feel when I can get out there and exercise. Yeah, so I think no, even more like about the, the business. The rig, the, just the, the occasional triathlon. Yeah. Uh, what's your favorite destination you love to travel to? Actually, I see a lot of lonely planets behind you on your bookshelf. Yeah, it's a bit old school, isn't it? Having the, having the, I still like the physical book. I, I love that having yeah. that physical book on a travel. Um, I've got my top, I got my top five. Oh, I think um, South Africa, Mexico, Norway, Peru, and Vietnam are my top five currently. Not in that order. I just blurted them out, but. That's a good list, and I will take a trip to any of them at this point. Uh, Christian, thank you so much for. Uh, 
being with us and uh, for giving us insight into Magpie and into uh, into your life. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. You bet. All right. Thank <laughs> you.